What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Fantasy Football Busters. Today is Thursday, November 3rd, and I am joined by Eric, my boy. How are you feeling today? What's up, everybody? I'm feeling good, man. Uh, glad to be here. This is my favorite video of the week, Buys and Sells. Um, and we got some community engagement, finally. I'm really happy that some people reached out to us in the comments. We're talking to us about our, our buy-sell video last week, so... We're going to shout you guys out uh, and talk about what you guys had to say. So I'm looking forward to that. Hell yeah, man. Thank you guys. And if you guys want your questions answered, drop them down in the comments below because we will answer them as you guys see and we'll see today. And like Eric said today, we're going to talk about our buys and sells for the week. Like we say every week, just because somebody's a sell doesn't mean we think they're ass. It just means we think, <laughs> you know, there's better, they could be on other people's teams and not yours. You know what I'm saying? So... <laughs> <laughs> Without further ado, let's go ahead and jump into these buys. Eric, how do you want to get us started with this one? So um, I do want to kind of do a review of our week eight buys and sells first, because some of these guys are going to be on the list again. Uh, some of the, the names are going to be new, but I just want to talk about how we did last week. Um, so the the names that we had on our buys for last week were Joe Mixon, Amon Ross St. Brown, T. Higgins, and Chris Godwin. Those were our main four. We had a few other guys that we can talk about as well. But um, of course, we put this video out right before the news broke about Jamar Chase being done for four to six weeks or whatever the case may be. Um, so that definitely changed the outlook on Joe Mixon and T. Higgins. Um, and then we saw them go out against the Browns and kind of disappoint. Um, it seemed like you know, they were trending up as an offense. They were starting to pass a lot more. They were getting really, really efficient with Jamar Chase. And then he's gone. The efficiency falls flat. Um, and so that hurt uh, the entire offense. But it hurt Joe Mixon, too, because they weren't able to move the ball as efficiently. And he's been struggling as a runner. Um, so I I'm interested to talk about him a little bit more with you. Mm -hmm. um, T. Higgins is the focal point of this offense now. He did end up scoring, and that kind of uh, saved his fantasy day. But he was looking disappointing prior to that, late in the game. Um, what are your thoughts on this Bengals offense now? Yeah, I think they're definitely they they've got to kind of find themselves. This is so I, Eric had talked about it in a prior video. I don't think it was this video; it was the one before. But I haven't been really huge on the Bengals at all this year, just because I feel like last year was lightning in the bottle. And people are kind of expecting them to do that again this year, which they very well could because it's the same players, the same supporting cast. Of course, Jamar Chase is hurt, but the team was not supposed to be good last year. They did get better on paper going into this year. So this year's team is better than last year's team. But in terms of their success, in terms of the efficiency, in terms of everything they got done last year, I don't think they're going to be able to do that again. And so far this year, they, they haven't done it again. But... In terms of the pieces and in terms of the players, I believe in each and every one of those players. I think T. Higgins could still have a good season. I think that Joe Burrow, obviously he's had great games. I think he's still going to end up finishing with a good season. It's just I don't know the brand of football that that team is playing anymore, if it's good, meaningful football anymore. That's the issue that lies with the Bengals for me. Yeah, I think you brought up a really good point. The, the team's – uh, efficiency in a lot of their their stats, uh, touchdown rate and yards per pass attempt and all that stuff from last year was really unsustainable. And we're seeing that come back down to earth a little bit this year. Um, and yeah, from, from player-specific points of view, Joe Mixon has kind of been up and down for me as far as whether he should be a buyer or a seller, really. Um, his underlying usage has been fantastic. He's He's been getting a ton of burn in the red zone, um, a lot of valuable touches and opportunities he just hasn't been converting them to touchdowns his efficiency has been really low whether you want to blame that on him or the offensive line tough to say um so i don't have a strong opinion on him either way at this point if the offense continues to struggle then uh, he might be closer to the sell range um and then t higgins is interesting also we listed him as a buy last week um but i think i might have liked him more as a buy with jamar chase on the team just because uh, his price would have been lower mm -hmm. and I think his efficiency would actually be higher. But now that he's the focal point in the number one, this offense isn't going to be quite as good. His price is probably higher and I don't think he's going to be all that much better. Um, so he's, he's really no longer a buy for me this week. Yeah, I, I agree with that. It's just the price you'd have to pay would be ridiculous. And with Jamar Chase, I know a lot of people are hopeful he's going to be back. His injury is a lot more serious than they're giving credit for. People are saying he'll be back week 12 at stud status is what I've seen. And I don't quite see that. I don't know. This 
seems like he's going to take some time, and I don't know if he's going to come back at full strength. Like that's his. We're talking about tendons in his hip, so I don't. Hips are pretty important yeah. when you're a wide receiver. Last I checked, but hey. <laughs> yeah, um, and then Amon Ra and Chris Godwin are two guys that are going to return on the list. So we'll talk about them more when we get to our week nine buys and sells. Um, Keenan Allen and Rashad Bateman were on here. We talked about the risks that were involved, and of course. Mm -hmm. That rears its ugly head almost immediately. Uh, Keenan Allen coming off the bye week, we had hoped he would be ready to go. He's still not ready with his hamstring issue. He's looking like he's trending not to play, so that's unfortunate. Uh, Rashad Bateman goes down with the Liz Frank foot injury. He re-aggravated it. He's going to be out at least for a few weeks. Um, Cortland Sutton was also on this list. <sighs> his performance as of late has been really disappointing, but I think part of that has just been difficult matchups. Um, the Broncos have the easiest wide receiver matchups as far as like uh, points allowed to the wide receiver position for the rest of their schedule. Um, so I think that things could be looking up for him, but it's it's really tough to bet on him in that offense. Yeah, it's tough to bet on. It's tough to bet on anybody in the Broncos offense with just the way they've been running that team. It's it's hard. But it's like I've said sort of before in earlier weeks, sometimes it's like the volume and the opportunities are too much that you kind of got to try it. But it's going to, you got to be prepared for it. It's not for the faint of heart. That's for sure. Yeah, for sure. And then uh, getting into our cells from last week, um, <laughs> we kind of got dunked on a little bit. I, I think the process was good. I think I, uh, I liked the reasons why we had these guy, guys on the list. Um, so the first one we had was Dalvin Cook. He had a fantastic game last week. Um, we were worried a little bit about Alexander Madison's involvement and his, his usage in the red zone and as a receiver. Uh, Madison did score in this one. He did vulture a touchdown that could have made Cook's week even bigger. Um, and a lot of it also has to do with injury history um, and his susceptibility to re-injure that shoulder. So if that rears its ugly head, then it'll look good. If not, he's just a really talented back and he's going to continue to eat. Yeah, definitely agree with that. Like it was never a question of Dalvin Cook's talent. It was more so just what this <clears> team <throat> is doing. You know, um, like you said, Alexander Madison getting a lot of burn, still able to get a touchdown off of Dalvin Cook last week. So still kind of shows that that is still an issue. And with Madison just coming <clears> off of injury as well, he may get ramped up a little bit more going into future weeks. So like I, like you said, We'll give that one a little bit of time before we say it's when we got dunked on, but at the same time, our thought process was still there. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and then Leonard Fournette was next on the list. He's back on the list again as a sell, so we'll talk about him more uh, when we get into our Week 9 stuff. And then Ramondre Stevenson. So this is where our shout-out comes into play. Um, it was Charles Hill uh, in the YouTube comments. He hit us up uh, either last night or this morning. Um, he said that I can't trade Ramond Ramondre Stevenson. The guy's a beast. He's exactly what I expected, and I think he's Bill Pelichek's guy. Harris, meaning Damian Harris, uh, is still going to get his, but Ramondre is the guy. He's non-game script dependent, and he's an RB1. So obviously, we made this list prior to the games last week, and he's he's coming uh, with that comment after the game. Um, so thank you for that. We appreciate your comment. Mm -hmm. um, and I think for the most part, I agree with you right? Like we were worried that Damian Harris was going to start to eat into this workload. And the thing is he did Damian Harris, I believe got 11 carries to Ramondre's what, like 19 or something. I don't know yeah, if the stats pulled pretty, up in front of me. It was pretty close. I can pull it up while you uh, talk if you want. Um, yeah. So Harris was definitely involved. He also caught a few passes. Um, so it's, it's not like uh, Ramondre's day could have been bigger and would have been more similar to what he had been doing in prior weeks had Harris not been involved. Um, I think Harris is going to continue to be a little bit annoying for Ramondre Stevenson owners. But yeah, Ramondre has been dominating in the passing game. He's been the team's leading receiver uh, for the past couple weeks and the leading target getter, I think, since week two. And if that continues, then his floor is super high. And I don't think it's necessary for him to be a sell, which is why he's actually not going to be back on the list again this week. Yep. And then just to reaffirm what Eric said, uh, Ramondre Stevenson with 16 carries for 71 yards, Damian Harris with 11 carries for 37 yards. So even closer than we had even initially thought between at least in Russia right. and with, you know, Ramondre Stevenson, seven catches, Damian Harris finished with two. So yeah. st still way more involved in passing than we would usually see even from Damian Harris. So yeah. yeah. 
So I, I think the point um, from Charles is a good one that he's probably not a sell anymore. And he's somebody that I have on a few of my teams. I'm holding on to him at this point. I'm not looking to get rid of him anymore. Um, but I, I'm still conscious of Damian Harris and what he's going to do, what he's going to take away from Ramondre. Um, <clears throat> and then the last three that we had on the list were Ezekiel Elliott, Debo Samuel, and Terry McLaurin. Um, Zeke's been hurt. Tony Pollard had a big game. It's going to be tough to sell him at this point. Debo, if you can still get value for him off the name, I think he's worth shopping around a little bit. Terry, how do you how do you feel about Terry? Will he he's had a, a couple good games in a row and against really tough matchups. Yeah, he's Terry McLaurin. He's always kind of been like he's as we know we're Washington fans. He's kind of been that guy since he's come to the team. But in terms of from a yeah. fantasy perspective, as much as I love Terry McLaurin as a football player, as a fantasy player, he's very stressful because a lot of the times where he ends up getting a lot of his points, they're from big plays, and you can't count on big plays every single week. And Terry doesn't deliver big plays every single week. So if you are able to get one of those boom weeks out of them, maybe somebody's more excited. They see that that, ta- that uh, <clears throat> timeshare went up, or not timeshare, target share went up with uh, Taylor Heineke back there under center. It's just one of those things where if you can offload them while you can and get something meaningful from them that you do see more consistency out of every week, I would go for it just because we don't know how consistent this Washington offense is. We don't know if when Carson Wentz comes back, if he's just going to get slotted right back into that starting role or not. So yeah. it's just... With the circumstances, if you can move Terry McLaurin, I would go for it still. Yeah, I think I think the point about whether Carson Wentz comes back is probably the biggest aspect because Taylor Heineke has clearly shown a rapport with Terry McLaurin. For me, like I agree with everything you said. I don't think you're wrong about any of that. Um, I, I think, I don't know that I would put him back on the sales list. I think if you're looking to get rid of him, it's a lot less urgent um, because like I said, he has overperformed against really tough matchups. I think he went up against Jair Alexander and Stefan Gilmore the past two weeks and still performed really well. Uh, and, you know, that schedule is going to open up for him a little bit. So it's possible that maybe brighter days are ahead. It, it, it's tough to count on, like you mentioned, but uh, I, I'm not selling him as urgently as I was last week. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, I can agree with that. Yeah, so let's... That'll wrap up our review of last week we can get into this week's buys and sells hell yeah so just to kick off this week's buys and sells as eric had alluded to earlier we're starting off with amon ross st brown uh somebody who coming into this season highly touted after a huge hot streak he ended last season with started this one off with a huge hot streak got injured hasn't quite gotten back to full speed yet uh he's somebody that i would buy low on just because well it's funny because it's been a meme for the last couple of weeks where, oh, how does this trade affect Amon Ross St. Brown's fantasy outlook? <laughs> but there really was a trade that affects Amon Ross St. Brown's fantasy outlook, and it's because the Lions traded away TJ Hawkinson to a division rival, which you don't usually see too often. But they traded yeah. away TJ Hawkinson. Amon Ross St. Brown already had a 30% target share in this offense. So with that being said, when... <clears throat> It was a question we had asked earlier with uh, Jamison Williams. If he were to get slotted into this offense, would it move anything for Amon Ross St. Brown for me? And at first I was like, it might eat into his target share a little bit. But now especially, I don't see that being any type of an issue whatsoever. I think that this team sees Amon Ross St. Brown as the number one, and they're treating him as such. So if you can go out there and you can get him for a low price, absolutely smash on that. Yeah, I I think... I think it might be possible. People have been waiting since really week four for him to blow up again. Um, but I have no reason to doubt him at this point. Like you said, they just traded away TJ Hawkinson, who I don't think was really stealing any targets from Amon Ra, because like you said, he was over a 30% mm-hmm. target share, but they work in similar parts of the field. Mm-hmm. Um, they're both kind of that underneath to intermediate, mil- middle of the field type receivers. So with him gone, all of that's going to go to Amon Ra. Um, and just looking back at his game logs, in games where he's been fully healthy, he's had 12 targets, 12 targets, nine targets, and 10 targets. He's, he like, that's so much opportunity. You can't ask for any better than that. Um, and in those games, he's put up 16 points, 35 points, 10 points, and 10 points. Better days are going to be ahead. He's going to continue to see that same volume. Uh, if they start scoring more points, then, you know, he's going to score more points too, and I think he's a fantastic buy low. Yeah. 100% agree. So if you can get Amon Ross St. Brown, go for it. And then next up on the list, Eric also mentioned earlier, we have Chris Godwin of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. 
He's somebody who, from a fantasy aspect, if you're playing in PPR leagues, you've probably seen Chris Godwin do pretty well. If you're playing in anything otherwise, even if it's half PPR, you're probably not getting the results <clears> you want out of him. His average depth of target, his average depth of target, you got it. Yep, has not been great. <laughs> He's been getting a lot of volume in terms of uh, you know, looks and targets, but he hasn't been getting a whole lot of depth, so not a whole lot of yardage, not a whole lot of scoring opportunities, even really for Chris Godwin. And that's something that we heavily expect to change. We expect this team to hit better strides. They've seen struggles as of late, but at the same time, talent kind of wins out at a certain point. You know, Tom Brady, he's still throwing the ball to these guys. Chris Godwin still coming off the injury, but playing extremely well coming off that injury still. It's brighter days are ahead for Chris Godwin. Brighter days are ahead for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers offense, honestly. Yeah, that's what I'm hoping. It's hard to keep Tom Brady down and it's hard for me to bet against him for an entire season. Obviously he's been really disappointing in his performance. The bucks overall same. Um, but yeah, Chris Godwin's usage has been fantastic since he came back in week four, similar to Amon Ra. He's just getting peppered with targets. He's seen 10 targets, six targets, 12, 13 and 11, um, since week four. So that's just fantastic usage. Hopefully that a dot does go up a little bit. We see that regress back to his career average. Um, and the main thing that you mentioned is hopefully they're just scoring more points as an offense. Cause if, if that happens, if we see touchdowns for Chris Godwin, he's going to start to explode. Um, so yeah, for a lot of the same reasons that we mentioned last week, Chris Godwin is once again, a buy low. Yeah, but he is working against the witch. So <laughs> tough sledding for the Buccaneers out there. And <laughs> next up on the list, somebody we've talked about a lot. We're going to keep talking about it. It's Mr. Gabe Davis of the uh, Buffalo Bills. We have him here as a buy low. He's coming off a pretty lackluster week. Um, he's somebody who's a buy low target because it's the same that we've been talking about. He's in this offense. We've seen the weeks where he is able to go absolutely crazy because this offense is as good as it is. They're able to draw things up. He's become, or not even become, he's always been, but he's a deep target for this uh, team. He's just really somebody who can take the top off. He's somebody who can go out there and he can get you three catches, three touchdowns, and 120 yards. And that's just a pedestrian day for Gabe Davis out here. But he'll also the next week come out and give you two catches for 15 yards. So it's one of those where you signed up for a roller coaster, but at the same time, somebody could very well be tired of being on that roller coaster. And you could be someone looking for that high ceiling, high upside play. And Gabe Davis is the epitome of a high upside play this season. So, yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. That, that upside is so crucial, especially at the receiver position. If you have a guy on your team that can put up a 30 ball, that's so valuable. And we know that Gabe Davis can do that at any moment. Um, and and we knew what we were getting into. At least we we talked about it in the preseason. We were a little bit nervous about Gabe Davis and whether he was actually talented enough to earn a big target share and all that stuff. But just because of how um, potent this offense is and how pass heavy they are, he's going to get his. And that's what we've seen so far. He's had three games, half of the games that he's played in where he's gone over 15 points, one of them for a 30 point game and the others where he's disappointed. But that's just the territory that comes with Gabe Davis. Um, this past week in week eight versus Green Bay, he actually saw some of his best usage numbers of the season. Um, he got his highest target total at seven. Um, and I think his target share was over 20%, which I think was the first time that happened all season. Um, so the usage is there. It just was a down game. He only got two of those seven targets and he didn't get in the end zone, but you know, touchdowns are a volatile stat. You're not going to see that all the time, but in an offense like this and with a guy like Gabe Davis, that's such a threat vertically, you're going to see him score a lot more. And that's why I want him on my team. Yeah, I like that. I like the rationale. It's just, yeah, it's like you said, those guys who can go out there and get you 30 points, those are the ones you want on your team. And you got to, sometimes you yes, just got to roll the dice on them. You got to play to win. Uh, yep. Next up on the buys list, we have Devonta Smith, who's coming off of a quiet game this past week. Very quiet. Uh, I think he ended with uh, five catches for 23 yards. A lot of people are going to look at that. They're going to look at how well uh, A.J. Brown did, who was able to get 156 yards and three touchdowns. And some people may see that and kind of panic and say, oh, well, they're only looking at A.J. Brown. Devonta Smith's not getting the looks. He's not getting the meaningful looks. But if you take a look at Devonta Smith, even though A.J. Brown was able to do what he did, Devonta Smith's still able to get eight targets this game, turn it into five catches. And when you have sort of underlying metrics like that, he's still very involved. And this is a very high-powered offense where 
anybody could put up three touchdowns any given week. We've had seen weeks where Miles Sanders went off. We've seen weeks where Devonta Smith has gone off, and A.J. Yeah. Brown didn't do much. It's just one of those offenses where you, you're you kind of riding a hot hand, but they've all got the opportunity to do something big. And if you see right. someone who's willing to give up Devonta Smith for something cheap, something you could take a look into. Yeah. Um, it, it has been a little bit of a rocky road with Devonta Smith, uh, which is why I think people might be panicked on him, like you said. Um, but he had a really good stretch from week two to week six before their bye, where he was actually fairly consistent. Um, put up over 11 points uh, in four of those five games and had one of those boom weeks like you talked about where he went. Uh, 12 targets, eight catches, 169 yards and a touchdown. Had his A.J. Brown week. Um, and yeah, I don't want to take anything away from A.J. Brown. He's an absolute beast. He is the number one wide receiver on the team. He's better than Devontae Smith. Um, and he deserves to get what he got last week. But all of these guys are super talented. Mm -hmm. Devonta Smith isn't such a huge gap in talent away from A.J. Brown that it's it's going to continue to trend that way for the rest of the season. We're going to see boom games for all these guys. Um, I'm really repeating a lot of what you said. But yeah, your analysis was spot on. Um, I think Devontae Smith has lots and lots of brighter days ahead. So if you can get him on your team at a cheaper cost than what he really should be at, then I think that's something you should try to do. Hell yeah. Also, Rocky Road, underrated ice cream flavor. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't mean to spit that one out, but yeah, uh, that's fine. I'm not a big Rocky Road guy, TBH. Damn. That, that's, we'll talk about it. Uh, <laughs> we'll talk about it. And then rounding out the buys, we have somebody who you may not be able to buy low, but depending on who the owner of this player, you may be able to, and that is Devontae yep. Adams. Uh, he's coming off one catch for three yards. We're getting into that, like we've talked about in earlier weeks, we're getting into that later half of the season where there may be some teams who are struggling and they may see a Devontae Adams put up 0.8 points for them in half PPR, and they're like, ah, I, I need somebody else. This guy's not cutting it. He's not doing it. The Raiders suck. They have been on a sort of downward trend as of late, which isn't the most encouraging in the world. I think they're going to end up getting it together, but the Raiders have been a confusing mess this whole year anyways. But De Devontae Adams has been one of the few bright spots on this team between him and Josh Jacobs. So if there's anybody I believe could bounce back, it's those two. So I'm not counting either yep. of those two out right now. So if you can find someone who is willing to sell Devontae Adams for a cheaper price just because of that downward slope, that downward trend, and their team is struggling a little bit trying to get into that playoff picture because stuff does get a little messy right now in the season, yep. uh, you could definitely go for that. Yeah, Devontae, if you watched last week's video, we talked a lot about Joe Mixon and his uh, actual fantasy point scoring versus his expected fantasy points. Devontae Adams is another guy that makes that list where his actual fantasy points is uh, like so much lower than what his expected fantasy points are based on the opportunity that he's getting. Um, and so I see he, with the opportunity, if that continues, which it has, you know, throughout the season so far, um, his his expectation is way higher. I see his fantasy points regressing to the mean, and he's probably going to end up within that top five group of wide receivers again. Um, I, I am a little bit nervous about this Raiders offense. They've looked mm -hmm. bad. Um, but if anybody is going to get force-fed, it's going to be Devontae Adams. So I, I'm not worried about him in particular individually. So, yeah, I would love to buy low on him. Um, and another shout-out to Charles Hill again. Uh, let me – I have it pulled up up here. He mentioned – a trade that he was trying to make. So he said, I'm trying to trade T Higgins and Tony Pollard for Devonte Adams. And I absolutely love this deal. Um, it's funny too, because we talked about T Higgins and whether he's a buy or sell and how that's changed since last week. Um, we already went through that with you guys. Devonte Adams, we had on this list. Uh, I put him on last night before Charles hit me up. And also Tony Pollard is a guy that's like borderline on this list just because he had an explosion game last week. But, of course, Jerry Jones comes out and says, nah, Zeke's the guy. Once we get back off the bye, once he's healthy, he's going to be our number one. So if anybody is buying into the Tony Pollard hype and is hoping that he's going to be the RB1 the rest of the way, he's probably a good sell. We'll talk about him more later. But, yeah, T. Higgins and Tony Pollard for Devontae Adams, I think, is a fair deal. I don't think it's like a crazy smash play on either side where one one side wins by a long uh, a long shot. But I like this deal a lot for Charles, especially he dropped his team in the comments, and I think – wide receiver is probably where he could use the most help. Um, 
but he if he gets this deal done is going to have a really dominant team chasing championships this year yeah absolutely also i will note uh mr hill uh took a look at your team saw you have the tickler at uh your backup quarterback uh, <laughs> mr watson uh, I see. I, I see the vision, though. I see the vision. Give him a little three-week tryout before fantasy playoffs. Let's <laughs> see if that works out for you, man. I wish you the best of luck. Your team really is really fucking good, dude. So, hell of a for job. Sure. Hell of a job. Yeah. Shout out. <laughs> All um, right. So also, before we get into the next thing, I <laughs> I want to shout out everybody that commented because that's really important. Oh. I love the engagement. Oh, yeah. uh, I forgot to get to this when we were talking about Ramondre earlier. Uh, Doomba commented an hour ago and was asking about Ramondre Stevenson in Dynasty. Um, he put in his league settings. He's in a 10-team, half PPR, one quarterback, six point per passing touchdown, two flex league. Um, he's trying to tank. He's got a lot of 23 firsts. He's asking, would you trade Ramondre for a late 23 first? I want to hear your thoughts on this one, Will. Mm, me personally, would I trade Ramondre for a late 23 first? It's 10 team league depends on how late that 23 first is if we're talking late like 8 to 10 i probably wouldn't me personally i would rather you know i always think players are better than picks and when you got a guy like ramondre stevenson who is playing well you've got uh damian harris is pretty much his biggest competition with that team and we don't even know how much longer he's really going to be with the team we also don't know how they're going to build things going forward so you know there's always things going to be in the air I always value players more than picks, and I think that Ramondre Stevenson is one of those guys that can be a stud on your team. But also taking a look at the running backs that you've got, right? So just to read it out real quick, he's got Ramondre Stevenson, Antonio Gibson, Travis Etienne, Cam Akers, Elijah Mitchell, Eno Benjamin, and who's who's Ford? Is that is it Jerome Ford. Ford? Jerome Ford. Okay. The yeah, Cleveland. Right. Back okay. up. Yep. Got gotcha. you. So just looking at that, you got Etienne, who's a stud going forward. You got Gibson, who's a little bit shakier. You got Akers, who the team had to convince him to come back and play. You got Mitchell, who has effectively been very much replaced by Christian McCaffrey. You got Eno, and you got Ford. If you think that you can anchor your team off of Etienne and spin it into getting another running back, another good running back, Maybe, but with the way that your team is built, I think you got a good thing going so far. I think you should keep going forward with what you have. But, I mean, Eric is more of the dynasty guy than I am. He probably knows a lot more about it than me. Well, I, I think I think that your takes are all valid. I, I don't know that I necessarily agree. Your, um, your take about picks being less valuable than players, and obviously that's situational. I'm sure that that's not the case, you know, just yeah, across not, the board. Yeah, not every single time, for sure. <clears throat> Um, but in his case where he's trying to tank, I think a lot of times it makes sense to, uh, when you're starting to build a team up, it makes sense to build through wide receivers who are less likely to get injured and are, who are more likely to retain value long-term. Uh, the lifespan on running backs is, is really short. Mm -hmm. Um, and so if you're in rebuild mode, I like to focus on the wide receiver position. So in your case where you're trying to tank, I think it makes sense to sell off valuable running backs for picks. I, I think that it's a pretty fair deal, him for a late first. It's tough okay. to decide either way. Um, but if if you're looking to trade either of those assets, right, like not one for one, but if you're trying to trade Ramondre for a player or if you're trying to trade the 23 first for a player, I think it's a lot easier to trade the pick, in my opinion, because um, with Ramondre, he's locked in at the running back position. If half your league is set at running backs or if they don't believe that Bill Pelichek is going to, uh, let him run as the RB1, they're going to continue to go by committee, then that limits your trade options where everybody has somebody in the draft that they want to take. Um, so I think that that opens up more flexibility. And also, let me pull this up. Um, the, 23, the 2023 draft class for running backs is beautiful. You got guys like B. John Robinson, Tank oh, Bigsby, true. Jameer Gibbs, Zach Evans, Sean Tucker, Zach Charbonnet, Devin A. Chain, Blake Corum, all these dudes, right? So I think you can really reload at running back if you wanted to, and I think you could do that with the 23 late first if you wanted to just straight up replace him. So I don't think it's a bad deal by any means. I'm fine with that. Um, I don't have a ton more insight, but super, I really, really appreciate you guys engaging with us. This is fun talking to you guys. I hope we can do it more. So and yeah, I, that was cool. And I will remind, if you are if you listen to both of us just now and you're like, well, Will said this and Eric said this, listen to Eric, like I said. 
<laughs> Eric knows more about that than I do. I'm still learning. I'm learning Dynasty myself, so I'm still figuring stuff out. Eric knows a lot more. Listen to Eric. <laughs> <laughs> Take us both into account. He, Will, had a lot of good things to say. But listen to Eric. <laughs> 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 but, uh, yeah, with that being said, hey, thank you so much for that comment, bro, because that was actually awesome. Because, like you said, this helps us all, honestly. It helps us. It helps you. It helps anybody who's listening. So, appreciate you coming. And hopefully, we see more of them. If you guys have comments, drop them down below. Thank you. And then that's going to take us into our cells, our cell highs. Uh, so just to start off that list, and like we said before, doesn't mean they're ass, but does not. we're starting off not quite hot. This is somebody we've been talking about for a while. We got Mr. Jonathan Taylor of the Indianapolis Colts, the uh, 101. Yeah. Yeah, that's looking like an unfortunate pick. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know that anybody expected this. Um, I, I'm certainly not happy about it, but I will say, I do think it's pretty funny that everybody was hating on CMC. We were touting CMC as our RB1. Mm -hmm. I not, We couldn't have predicted his trade to the 49ers. That was a huge boost that we didn't see coming. Mm -hmm. But just the fact that everybody was like, I can't draft CMC. He's going to get hurt. I can't draft CMC. How many games has he missed in the past two years? I can't draft CMC. Blah, 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 blah. Look who's healthy now. Come on now. <laughs> Look Come on. Dog, it's the the injury narrative is always so funny, bro. Because it's like all these guys get hurt. Literally, Zeke mm -hmm. hasn't played this past week. They all get hurt at some point in the season. Using injuries That's for just... running backs is asinine. Exactly. That's just what happens to running backs. It's one of the most violent violent positions in the sport. They're the most likely to get injured. That's just what happens. It's it's variance. Simple as that. Yeah. So. <clears throat> so just to get a little bit more into, I guess, the analysis of it. <laughs> we Sorry got, for the rant. <laughs> oh, no, I, I was feeling it too. But we got Jonathan Taylor, who, as everyone knows, he's been an underperformer so far this year, especially for where he was drafted at, where he was touted at. A lot of people are saying he's washed, this and that. That's not the case, guys. It's just circumstances. He should be good at some point, again, in his career, whether that's this year, whether that's next year. He will be good again. It's not yep. the end of Jonathan Taylor whatsoever. But – there are some concerns this season. The offensive line for the Colts not playing as well as they usually do, not up to the same standards as they usually are. It's been absolute turmoil at the quarterback position now that Matt Ryan's been benched, the guy who was supposed to be the answer for everything. He's yeah. gone now, Sam Ellinger, holding it down. And Jonathan Taylor with this ankle injury that he isn't practicing on, hasn't practiced yet this week. I guess we'll get news today, uh, recording this on Thursday. So we'll get news if he practices today, but it's not looking great. Um, it's just it's not the best signs for a running back going forward uh, this season. Do you what do you have to say about Jonathan Taylor? Yeah, I think there's a lot of signs pointing towards uh, more disappointment as the season goes on. I, I think we just talked about Dynasty. If you're in Dynasty, I'm not selling low on him. Um, his value is going to return. I think next year he'll be fine. Um, but as far as the rest of this season, it seems like the team's kind of given up on the year. They're saying Sam Ellinger is going to be the guy for the rest of the season. Um, Jonathan Taylor has now re-aggravated the ankle. Their record is really bad. Um, they're getting passed up in their division right now. So if they, it, it's not impossible that they just decide to shut him down. I'm not predicting that. I'm not saying that's going to happen, but that's within the range of outcomes. And then also if he does play, I was looking through Twitter to try to see uh, what the injury doctors and stuff like that, Edwin Porras, FB injury doc, recently put out an update because he was initially more optimistic on this Jonathan Taylor injury. But after the re-aggravation, he seems to think that this could kind of mirror what we saw from Saquon Barkley last year because he was coming back off the ACL but was actually looking really good and then suffered that high ankle sprain and he was really disappointing for the rest of the season. And he's saying that this is a similar situation and Jonathan Taylor might struggle even if he does play. Um, so if there's somebody out there in your leagues that still believes in the talent of Jonathan Taylor, which is fair, um, and thinks that he's going to bounce back, I think it's probably worth shopping him at this point. Yeah, 100% agree. I think it's worth it. And you might be able to get something good back for him. It's just name value does mean a lot in fantasy football, especially in home leagues. So, yep. yeah. And then next up on the list, somebody we talked about earlier as well, Mr. Leonard Fournette. Uh, the team's been struggling. The run game has been struggling a lot. I know, Eric, you, this is somebody you've kept an eye on the entirety of the season, so I'd, <clears throat> I'd like to hear your commentary on this before I give anything on it. 
Yeah, I mean, if you watched our last week's video, it's a lot of the same stuff that we already talked about. Um, his usage has been going down week after week. Rashad White's involvement has been going up, um, especially in the passing game, which is where Leonard Fournette has been making his money because he can't get anything going on the ground. This team as a whole can't get anything going on the ground. The interior of their offensive line has been decimated by injuries. They're underperforming. Um, but Fournette has been inefficient on the ground for the past couple of years, really. So we wouldn't expect him to kind of overcome um, the issues that they have at their offensive line. So if you're hoping that he's going to continue to be a valuable fantasy asset, it's going to be through the air. And I, I just am a little bit nervous that Rashad White is going to start eating into those opportunities. Um, and so that's why he sees this list again for me. Yeah, I agree with that. I think it's, he's just, he's on a really downward trend and Rashad, White, I'm not going to say Rashad White's on an upward trend, but he's there. Like, he is very much there. I think this past, last two games, Leonard Fournette's had under 12 or fewer uh, touches, whereas Rashad White's had seven. At least seven, or, yeah, at least seven touches. So, it's just, it's getting more and more even. Leonard Fournette isn't really running away with it. It's just, his last week was saved because he was able to score. You know, and yeah. you don't want to depend on that. He's starting to become touchdown dependent, and you don't really need that, especially going into getting close to playoffs. Need somebody a little bit more dependable who's really going to be involved. And it's just, it's tough to see. You know, we had talked earlier about Chris Godwin and how we think this offense is going to get better, the team's going to bounce back. It's right. easier to say that from a passing perspective because they're struggling as much as they are because of Tom Brady and stuff he's going through. Some general struggles there, but Leonard Fournette shouldn't be as affected by all of that as he has been lately, you know, in terms of his usage, stuff like that. These are just usage trends that we're talking about, not even yeah. team trends. So that's the difference there. Yeah, it is a little bit of a double-edged sword. Um, if we are expecting the team's touchdown rate to go up, then we should expect Leonard Fournette to see more scoring opportunities, which is a fair assessment, but it's risky either way. Like it, it doesn't seem like this team is really committed to the run game. It doesn't seem like they're going to try to fix it. They're going to try to do most of it through the air if they can. Uh, their pass rate over expectation, I think, has been tops in the league, or at least close to it. Um, so yeah, Fournette's going to have to get it done through the air. And Rashad White has really just passed the eye test, in my opinion. He's looked like the more explosive, faster, elusive back. Yeah. Uh, and so it's just a it's just a matter of time until the team starts to you know, maybe not lean in favor of him, like taking over, but before it becomes more of a timeshare, a 50, 50 split. Yeah, I agree. It's just, it, it's unfortunate, but we see it all the time in football. So it's just, we're going to see how things yeah. go going forward. But if you're able to get something good for Leonard Fournette coming off a good game, like I said, I'd say go for it. And it's yeah. Some, and and oh, go ahead. sorry to cut you off again, but that I want to reiterate it. Cause you know, we talk about it every video, but it's not like Leonard Fournette's going to be a bum the rest of the way. He's going to continue to produce. He's going to be good. If you sell him, like there are going to be times where you see him on another team having a good game. But if you can get something good, if you can get like a, I don't know. I, I've been pleased with the way that Damian Pierce has been playing and his usage has been fantastic. Even when they've been in uh, negative game scripts, he's still been on the field uh, and being targeted. So somebody in that kind of range of running backs where they're like outside of that top group, I'd be happy with somebody like that. Yeah, very much agree. And then somebody else we got on the list that we had talked about earlier as well, Mr. Debo Samuel. Uh, Someone who he's been hurt for the last couple of weeks, but he's still a sell high in our opinion just because of how well he did last year and, you know, name value going into this year. I'm sure there's still a lot of people who are looking at that last season and saying, oh, he can do that again, he can do that again, which he very well could. We're not saying that it's out of his range of outcomes, but... It gets a little bit harder to see if he could do that well because of what they've done with this team. Because Debo Samuel used a lot in the running game. This team hasn't been super confident in their running backs. They've had a very much a stable of running backs back there with Jeff Wilson, Elijah Mitchell uh, last year, Trey Sermon. It was just uh, Tevin Coleman. It's just always a carousel back there. But as of recently, they've gone out and gotten the best running back they've had in probably the last 10 years in Christian McCaffrey, and you no longer really have a need to have a gadget guy who can mix in with the runs and give people different looks when you have someone as talented back there as Christian McCaffrey. So how Debo Samuel is going to be used going forward, if he's going to see that same rushing floor that he had before, I don't know if we're going to see that same Debo Samuel anymore. But there is also a chance that Christian McCaffrey could open up the field a little bit more for Debo. We don't really know. 
So it's us saying that you can get some name value off of Debo in a situation where he either could stay where he's at, which is, you know, still a decent, good fantasy production, or he gets relegated quite a bit because we've also seen Brandon Ayuk come forward in the receiving game as well and sort of take over there. Even in the games where Debo played and was healthy, he was still getting outpaced by Brandon Ayuk. So it's not the most encouraging stuff going forward for Debo, for sure. Yeah, I honestly don't have too much to add. I think you covered all the points that I wanted to hit. Um, Christian McCaffrey has been kind of playing that Debo role that uh, Debo had prior to his addition. Um, and he's looked fantastic in it in, you know, uh, granted a small sample size. Um, Debo's still an amazing player. Uh, the 49ers know that. NFL teams know that. He's going to be involved. Um, and this offense is going to be really, really exciting to watch. But I think from a fantasy perspective, it's going to be hard to con- count on a lot of consistency from him um, or at least like difference making consistency because he had been consistent so far this season. I think he had been scoring just over 10 fantasy points Mm -hmm. almost every game. Um, So if that's what you're into, then that's great. But as somebody that you drafted probably in the second round um, and and draft value at this point in the season doesn't matter, but as somebody with that type of name value, I think you could probably get a higher level producer at this point. Yeah. It's just, we're seeing a team. We're seeing a 49ers team with a good running back now, like a really good yeah. running back, a great running back even, and we've never seen that yeah. before, or not recently, but you know what I'm right. saying. And then to round out the list for our sell highs, we got Mr. Tony Pollard, someone who popped off last week. There's going to be a lot of people out there still riding that high who think that oh he popped off, he did all this. Oh man, the Cowboys love him. They're going to see this game. He's going to be the <laughs> starter. It's going to be great. He's a league winner. Guys, we do this every year. Yep. We literally, it's literally every single year. Zeke goes out for a game. Tony Pollard produces. The same exact thing happened last year. Tony Pollard scored 31.5 points. Where was he the next week when Zeke came back? On the fucking bench. And then yep. he got maybe, you know, his usual uh, six to eight, ten carries a game. So it's just, it is what it is. They love Zeke over there. Tony Pollard's not really going to be the guy going forward unless something happens to Zeke, which. We're not hoping for, obviously. I'm sure Tony Pollard uh, owners out there are. Which, <laughs> yeah. But at the same time, you guys get what I'm saying. It's If you can sell Tony Pollard to somebody who believes that Zeke is going to be relegated after this performance from Tony Pollard, then, yeah, I would absolutely say go for it because you might be able to get something really good off of Tony Pollard. Yeah, and I think that's the key there. To somebody who thinks that like Tony Pollard's going to be the guy, I wouldn't. I wouldn't try to trade him to people that know <laughs> what the deal is, the people that heard Jerry Jones come out and say that Zeke's still going to be our guy for the rest of the season. This one's more contingent on just your league mates and how they feel about Tony Pollard. Um, if you can sell high off of that performance and have people expecting that that's going to continue going forward, then absolutely do that. Um, but again, Tony Pollard's a guy that's going to produce for you. Um, he, he had been doing okay behind Zeke. Mm-hmm. And I think Zeke is probably going to be hobbled, slowed, even a little bit more after this knee injury throughout the rest of the season. So Tony Pollard could see a little bit more usage. So it's not like he's somebody that I hate the rest of the way. He's not going to do well. It's just if you can capitalize on a game like this, you probably should. Yeah, absolutely. If, you, if there's someone out there that thinks, oh, Tony Pollard guaranteed 20 points for the rest of the season, 20 points every game, yeah, bro, sell him to that guy. Let him have him because – it's one thing that I've learned. It's a hobbled Ezekiel Elliott does not stop them from playing him at all. They don't give a fuck. Yeah. He's going to be out yep. there. <laughs> He's going to be out there running and tripping for three yards. And it's going to exactly. be so frustrating. <laughs> Facts. But, you know, with that being said, that's going to round out our buys and sells for the week. Thank you to everybody that commented. We'd love to see more of those. Keep them coming. They, we will put them in videos because that's it's awesome to see that. So we love the involvement. And check us out on our other socials as well. You can check us out on Twitter. Uh, follow us on there. You'll see us post some stuff about fantasy football, uh, just typical football news even. Um, also, you can follow us on TikTok. We got a lot of stuff on there that we don't put on here. We'll put like updates, uh, sit starts. We've got a good uh, waiver wire video we put out usually every week. We've got spin the wheel challenges to God every single week. So we're trying to put more out there as well. TikTok's been doing pretty well, so go ahead and check us out there too. And Eric, you got anything for the people while we sign out? Yeah, I uh, just wanted to reiterate, thank you so much for the engagement mm-hmm. to Charles Hill and to Doomba for hitting us up in the YouTube comments. I hope 
you guys enjoyed being featured in this video and I hope some more people will be down to do that because we love interacting with you guys. So that would be great. Um, all the typical YouTube stuff, like, comment, subscribe, uh, that helps us out a lot. Uh, like I said, we love the engagement. Um, and also for the comments specifically, clearly we're answering you guys' uh, fantasy football questions. Any sort of advice, whether it be start sit, whether it be trades, whether it be dynasty, any of that stuff. We're giving out free fantasy football advice each and every week. You just got to ask us the question. So go ahead and do that and we'll help you out. Um, if you stuck with us all the way till the end, we love you as always. Thank you very much for being with us. And uh, yeah, check us out on the other socials. Check us out for videos coming out down the line. We'll catch you in the next one. Peace. Peace. I'm winning, I'm winning, I'm winning again. How could I lose? I was born just to win. Could never lose, so I'm winning again. I'm winning, I'm winning, I'm winning again. I'm winning, I'm winning, I'm winning again. Minute by minute, I'm meeting the end.